Howdy, HCRG here. Welcome to my Aspect Anarchy special. A damn fine assembly we've got here, wouldn't one say? Hence that title, I'm covering three select entries by the Asmic Corporation, otherwise known as Asmic Ace Entertainment today, a company whose time in the US was rather short-lived, in spite of its attention-drawing adorable pink dinosaur seen in each title they put out, namely Boomer, aka Asmic-kun. First and foremost, all history lessons aside, we're diving into Conquest of the Crystal Palace, otherwise known as Maten Doji in Japan for the NES, first developed and released by Quest in said territory during the summer of 1990, and brought to the US months later by the aforementioned Asmic. Before my three-part analysis goes down, I'd like to, as always, offer my utmost acknowledgments to Hall, Kultoff, Clark, and Allen from the BitBar and BitFest committee in Boston Retro Gamers, Fleming's Bobrun, Mike Lindquist from JP, Matt Michael and Sarah Rostone from Frank, California, Matt Lister and Ian Bergerson from New Hampshire, Gabriel J. Riley, Scout 100 to Betancourt, Space Kappa Walker, Mike Maverick Lafitte from Waynesboro, Mississippi, James Rolfe and Mike Mertzay from Cinemassacre, Enver Perez from Lawrence, David Riley Jr. from Lynn, 8-Bit Eric Perez from Texas, Michelle Osorio from Boston, aka MyTurf, and elsewhere, Worcester-based photographer Alana Gordon, Cambridge-based photographer and actress Erica Derrickson, renowned anime voice actresses Michelle Knotts and Monica Rial, Borealic and Biffle Cup from Geekby Radio, that's Carballo and Jubisky respectively, TZB and Crunkwitch, Sam Mulligan, MC Face Palm, Nick and Ashley DiStefano, Lowry and Brack, Becky Cote from Maine, and finally Mary Pearl and the Amoroso siblings. The main plot of Conquest of the Crystal Palace revolves around the journeys of Farron, aka Tendo, and his faithful canine companion Zap, who after having their glorious titular kingdom, namely the earlier recounted Crystal Palace, aka the Heavenly Palace, ruled by King Bratorn Queen Zyla, toppled and ransacked by the cold-hearted, shit-devouring Dark Emperor and War Spirit, specifically King Zaris of the Infernal Plateau, and his followers, are out to take back what's rightfully fucking theirs. Need the hell anymore be said? As far as gameplay, what could one possibly expect but another action platforming romp? Upon commencement, after Zap lays down the deets regarding the pair's hardships and tribulations, he offers you a choice of which special crystal to utilize throughout the course of your journey, all of which you're able to purchase later in the form of other items, the Life, Flight, and or Spirit Crystals. Good for boosting up Farron's life force a notch, making Farron jump higher, or summon fireballs at will respectively. Take note, no matter which crystal you pick, you're only stuck with one. Kingdom Hearts anyone? Considering that franchise didn't kick off until over a decade later. After selecting your desired special crystal, it's off through a myriad of side-scrolling action platformer hybrid capers as you're guiding the fearless young Farron and Zap through the oriental countryside of the Crystal Realm, leading up to the vast hellish Infernal Plateau Empire and surrounding domains of Zaris and his disciples. In theory, all Farron's limited to is his katana blade attacks and standard leaps via the typical B and A, respectively, the ability to summon and or call back his pet in the style of Sega's Shadow Dancer with a special whistle, along with various magical incantations via down and A. Looking at you, Ninja Gaiden. At certain portions of your current area, you get to visit an item shop, namely the Astral Mart, run by Kim. Not these two Kims, for fuck's sake! Who also doubles as a reporter. Move over, April O'Neil, within which you're able to purchase special and mandatory needs, for example, extra lives, health refills in the form of medicinal herbs, attack skills, ability enhancements, life extension potions, that earlier recounted dog whistle for Zap, including even his own rations, no less, and the like. Take note, you need enough pre-gathered moolah from various slain foes, River City Ransom much? And even listen in on updates of the Kingdom's events CNN style. Depending on your actions in terms of whether you've purchased a multitude of affordable items, or mindlessly attempting to purchase something you're barely even able to afford, Kim will either turn romantically rapturous, thus applying a massive discount for future visits, or become extremely pissed off, thus resulting in an immediate expulsion from the shop, respectively. Talk about a balance in mood variety! Enemy lineup-wise, Farron and Zep confront all sorts of territorial critters and spiritual beings alike, while braving numerous perils, the latter of which will be touched upon in a minute or two, running the gamut from slugs, aka skull lizards and Maten Doji, skeleton warriors, those infamous birds, again, ninja guiding much, overgrown rock warriors, golems if you will, purple monkeys, living eyes, Venus flytraps, oh god, more Audrey 2 wannabes. Can the NES library be more oversaturated with these motherfuckers? Vampire bats, living loose hands, dang, meet your new fucking best friend, miniature clouds, tombstone men, spiders and other tentacled creatures, otherwise known in the Japanese version as half-infant demons, spiked red demons with porcupine-like hair, the list goes on and on and on and on and fucking on. In the end bosses, ranging from all sorts of demonic warriors and deities alike, Kentar and Kellex, Kurgan, no, not the Highlander antagonist portrayed by Clancy Brown, two boulder-like apparitions in the forms of the Will of the Ghost that summons those same tentacled creatures, and the Desire of Fire, and finally Zaras himself and his guards. Let's just say that their patterns and mannerisms definitely trump those of the Dark Queen, Robo Manus, and Big Black from Battletoads, a Bobo, Roper, and Linda from Double Dragon, the combined efforts of the Foot Clan and Stone Warriors from Dimension X, and even Team Rocket from Pokemon any goddamn day, and will all but mop the floor with your testicles and arteries if you're not fully prepared and or equipped. 
Should you happen to dispatch the merciless assassins, however, you're on your way to the following area, and it's the traditional rinse, lather, repeat procedure from there, in juxtaposition with more intense, soul turning assfucker that awaits you further ahead. Undeterred by the excruciating foobar and mind numbing control aspect, circumstantially fair and dropping down as fast as a meteor shower whenever he lands from a midair slash, recovery from the traditional infamous post damage knockback, or keeping your pet partner zap in check, I might add, they're nothing short of satisfactory and straightforward. Likewise, with, yep, you guessed it, the traditional gameplay shtick. Concerning Crystal Palace's challenge, in addition to everything I've laid down thus far regarding the usual adversary encounters, as much of a walk in the park as the first few portions turn out to be, every other menacing liability and mechanic will fry both your dexterity and woods like an order of sunny-side up omelets. In other words, don't expect this game to suck your dick. For instance, in Stage 2, there's a multitude of chaotic perils for which you keep both your eyes widely peeled, including random bottomless pits which will send your ass back to the beginning, minus any instant life losses, of course, levitating boulders and blade traps aplenty, streams of demon puke, and even towering flames in Stages 3 and 4, combined with the occasional waterfalls, lava falls, and larger boulders that'll still catch you the hell off guard. Getting back on track with the boss confrontations, which, for the record, require the usual foolproof precision, strategy, planning, the whole fucking schmear. Hell, there's even one at random that'll grant you a special item in that very same stage upon gravitating through a secret crevice and overcoming said confrontation, namely the Moon Mirror, supplied by a captive spiritual Crystal Palace Maiden, with which Farron can eradicate all adversaries in his range, only good for one use, no less, akin to the Crucifix in the Castlevania franchise, or hell, the satellite in Bandai's Dino Wars. While in the original Japanese version, the aforementioned Matendoji, you only start with three continues, here you're stuck with kind of a semi-finite continuation benefit, depending on your current progress. Other than that, keep in mind each and every tip I've addressed thus far, and be sure to manage your frequency in terms of commanding and or feeding zap accordingly. As typical as the graphics appear to be, especially for a mid-lifespan NES obscurity, they're far from an absolute mess of blemishes, and don't disappoint a slight smidgen. Combined with the ethereal, ancient Chinese themes and infernal hellish backgrounds, the overall cast of characters, for example, Farron, Zap, Kim, what have you, are rather lively, both in-game and in close-up profile form animation-wise, and add a hell of a lot to the experience. They're no Mega Man, Rock, if you will, Rush and Roll, or Quinn, Sophie, and Christy from Vice Project Doom, but holy frickin' Toledo do they come close. As intimidating as the foes are, they're far from complete pussies, except for the earlier types, of course, offense-wise and threat-wise, and are all-around dynamic in my book. Masterfully composed by Tomohisa Mitsuyasu, a Puss in Boots and Fist of the North star fame for Toei Animation Showy System, with maybe a smidgen or two of assistance from Masaharu Iwata, who's also this game's primary sound designer, also of the Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre series, another batch of quest creations, I might add, not to mention Final Fantasy Tactics and 12, alongside Atoshi Sakamoto for Square Enix, the overall musical soundtrack really captures the earlier recounted Oriental theme, in tandem with a variety of moods, from calm and serene to more menacing and vehement mannerisms only they can bring to the table like no one else, notwithstanding the NES's low quality sound of the time. As convincing as the sound effects are, however, they just flat-out scream meh all over the place and leave a GREAT deal to be desired, except for Zap's barks and howls, and Farron's sword slashes. My top 6 favorites from this game alone are as follows, Zap's intro and stage clear jingle, stages 1 and 2, the Q&N news report at the Astral Mart, and boss themes A and B for every other boss and Zaris's gate, respectively. Concerning Crystal Palace's replayability, although this particular title hasn't been gaining much groundswell into a standard sense of recognition over the years, it's a near-flawless, top-notch title, and a rather worthy and beneficial entry in any curious NES enthusiast and or collector's library due to ever-redeeming factor, fundamental, and merit I've recounted. All in all, consider yourself off your goddamn rocker to even ponder turning Crystal Palace to hell down! Exhibit B, Boomer's Adventure in Asmic World, released for the Game Boy earlier that same year. If either of the following individuals are watching this, Justin DeLucia and Matt Azaro, otherwise known as Cygnus Destroyer 20 X and the LGN Defender, this is for the both of you. The plotline, despite its in-game absence, involves the history of the titular Asmic World, which was once a peaceful civilization inhabited by beings evolved from dinosaurs, like we haven't seen that already. Until one day, Zazun and his ruthless mutant guards wasted absolutely no time gaining control over it. Now, it's up to the also titular mascot character, namely the earlier addressed Boomer, to overthrow those monstrous, shit-spewing, pissant motherfuckers, and regain that control by retrieving each and every World Tower Key. Being much more than just your typical action-adventure trap em up hybrid, akin to the likes of Heyanko Alien by Meldak Life Planning Hyperware and the Tokyo Science Group, which was released earlier that same year, and even Doug Smith's Load Runner, I might add. You assume the role of Boomer as he traverses through each maze and finds each corresponding gate key by digging for it, while keeping every unsuspecting foe within his perimeter at bay by, who could've guessed, burying the bejesus out of their pernicious asses via only the A button, which, by the way, has dick all to do with John Cena, period! Anyways, wrestling gags aside, the first no-sweat, no-brainer excuse for a stage has just you acquiring the first key and reaching the stairwell. But just you wait, the path gets more and more treacherous from here on out.
Various foes range from coastal life, especially shelled creatures, worms, wolves, and other random critters. In addition to their digging capabilities, if they happen to get near you, or vice versa, your ass is extinct, pure, plain, and simple. There are other mandatory items, however, that can be dug up and discovered for assorted purposes. Just simply use B, a compass for detecting the precise location of the gate key, whether buried or being carried by an opposing creature, limited to five uses, no less. A magnetic receiver also used for locating the key via a special tone depending on your distance, akin to the tracking receiver in Jaws. An egg for an extra life, weapons including bones and boomerangs, both of which are limited to one and three uses, respectively, the latter if your catching proficiency is dead on enough. And even a spiced meal in order to make boomers spew out flame for a few limited uses, shit if maybe only one. And trust me, as scarce as some of these items are, you'll need each of them at your disposal if you fully intend on reaching each tower maze floor. Before I forget, there's a time limit of 200 seconds per level. Same case applies to the boss run-ins. I wouldn't be too goddamn surprised if I were you if it runs the hell out. Speaking of the latter, these usually occur every 8th stage, and holy godfather of cum shit shitballs are they menacing! At least there's more items for which to uncover and put to the best possible use during these situations. Most notably, a shovel for faster digging, and a pair of roller skates for enhanced speed. Bomberman, or god forbid, the Tower of Draga much? Laced with shit tons of buried bones. In addition to possessing the reflexes of Kane Kosugi, the precision of Lee Harvey Oswald, and the patience of a fucking Buddhist monk, I strongly suggest dishing out as much pain as possible in the most effective and reasonable time span of all, hence the focus of our following customary mood points. Control-wise, they're on something of the derelict and corroded side, predominantly regarding Boomer's migration speed and digging proficiency, you know, slower than Molasses, Max from Streets of Rage 2, Ludo from Labyrinth, and Lesser the Unlikely combined, but are still nothing short of submissive overall, and the gameplay formula boils down to a thin line between a milk run and a paradox, if possibly the former. In terms of challenge, if you're expecting any bright lights and or a lifetime supply of Swiss cheese at the end of this long, dark tunnel of a game, oh how royally and anally fucked those expectations would turn out to be. Do I even need to suggest referring back to my previous subtopics for the sake of avoiding redundancy? And since we're still on the shtick of the level-by-level -level routines, aside from digging for necessary items, fending off and distracting every testicle-puking rectal ward of a creature runs the gamut from a spring picnic, mostly in terms of setting up as much ground openings as possible, you know, just like Heyankyo Alien, to a mindless-ass chore. And as you advance further, be prepared to contemplate more of the latter, cause in addition to your mandatory gatekeep being buried in the same location regardless of how often you play, in some cases, your rivals will end up digging and snatching said mandatory key. The solutions to this issue? 86 their asses before it's claimed forever, or better yet, use your earlier stated compass and or detector and hope for the best. Regarding the boss altercations, their patterns are as random as a slot machine combo result, albeit a trifle cakewalkish. For example, the giant goblin bouncer, aka Axolotl, hops around like a complete dipshit, sometimes in a straight row or diagonally, thus if he hits any walls, resulting in a side tilt. A walrus like Beetle, not to be confused with a Volkswagen car, that attacks by forming randomized yet temporary ground cracks barring its slow migration speed. Spike, a porcupine like behemoth that sports poison needles, and a mop that fires off a crap ton of poison spores to name a few. And I swear to Christ Almighty, as I mentioned before, each and every one of those unrelenting douchebags will do more than provide you with 50 shades of the red ass, which is also why I advise referring back to the previous subject. Oh, and consider yourself in the deepest shit imaginable if your migration space and digging proficiency is less than abundant. Lastly, whenever Boomer digs his own holes, I wouldn't go so goddamn far as to accidentally fall into one of them, cause he'll briefly end up drudging within it, thus leaving yourself fucked beyond all description factors, and worse yet, open to any sudden adversary collisions. Starting out with three lives, more of which, again, can be awarded by acquiring eggs, and absolutely no continues, there's even a password system composed of all letters and a few punctuation symbols for later play sessions in case you've got other real-life commitments, as ever, they can be either written down or looked up online for future reference. Beyond that, take every statement of advice I've addressed earlier to heart, unless you're dying for an all-expenses-paid trip to the 7th level of hell and beyond. As expected, the graphics are very standard for an underrated, early-strategy puzzle romp, taking into utmost consideration Boomer's quirky and carefree demeanor, and his opponent's mischievous and oftentimes relentless mannerisms. The labyrinthine ground maps are unique to each section, albeit a trifle archaic, hence why there's barely any difference at all between the corresponding stage structures, and since we're dealing with an 8-bit handheld, every item Boomer and or his opponents on Earth is quite distinguishable for the most part. Music and sound-wise, considering there's no credits indicated, including any composers no less, my god, talk about your factory panic syndrome. But then again, since it is an asthma game, it could've been the handiwork of one Dota Ando, who worked on this game's Japan-only sequel not long after, namely Asthma Kun World 2. Anyhow, while each tower floor sequence contains their own theme, likewise with the boss confrontations, the entire soundtrack is campy and gratifying, albeit unnerving and vexatious after at least 6-8 loops. The sound effects are pretty much the same spiel, despite their tendency to grate on your nerves after quite some time, thus losing their allurement and spark in the process. And take note of my only noteworthy song shown above.
Concerning Boomer's Adventures replayability, in spite of the verbose gameplay aspects, a lack of diagonal traversing capabilities, and or more useful items, say time extensions or screen nukes, or that the Asmic mascot hasn't been well known, not to mention the Game Boy Puzzle Boom's been rather oversaturated at the time, it's still a decent and rather worthy addition to any handheld enthusiast's growing library. And to top it off, a faithful homage to and expansion of Heyankyo Alien. Seriously, why the hell leave it out in the blistering cold any goddamn longer? <laughs> Oh, and before I forget, remember that Japan-only Game Boy sequel I threw out earlier? In addition, there's also a Famicom platformer spin-off, namely Asmikun Land, aka what I like to call Boomer and Asmic Land, both of which I also suggest scoping out for all the import aficionados out there, yours truly included. Final exhibit, and my dear gentle Christ are reading for some serious shit here, the infamous D-Force, released for the Super NES the following year as one of its earliest titles, I might add, otherwise known as Dimension Force in Japan. From what I understand, this was regarded as one of the worst shmups ever conceived. But then again, why the hell waste another goddamn second? It's about time I found out. The story involves a ruthless Middle Eastern dictator hellbent on neutralizing our civilization thanks to his own sophisticated brand of high-tech weaponry, and now it's up to a lone pilot, or a team of pilots, of an Apache helicopter, though in-game it doesn't look anywhere alike, except on the cover, to thwart his devious as fuck efforts. Compelling premise is compelling. NOT! Gameplay-wise, who could've guessed? Another top-view vertical-scrolling chopper-based shmup! Tall Plan's Tiger Heli and Twin Cobra much? As expected, you're tasked with eliminating the piss out of every rogue military aircraft, whether it's a plane, gunship, what have you, and occasionally mounted weapons, animals, mythological beings, and apparitions. Each area, of which there's seven for the record, involves not only evading enemy fire in tandem with aforementioned slew of objectives, but also eradicating both the mid-boss and end-boss throughout. And to top it all off, you can actually raise and or lower your chopper's altitude by the L or R buttons, depending on which stage you're in, in said case all the even number stages, or which mode you're experimenting with, in other said case, the exploration mode. Weaponry-wise, your chopper can obtain pink capsules to broaden its firepower, deployed with white or B, and green capsules for the missiles. In true Darius twin fashion, your firepower is still intact even after your ass gets totaled, with the exception of the missiles upon continuing. As your headway matures throughout each area, you'll notice right away that every attempt to evade enemy collision and or offenses is far from a walk in the goddamn park. Hell, even in spite of its semi-constant slowdown, and regardless of which difficulty mode you've chosen beforehand, your chances of improvement and progression are equivalent to a panda's genitalia, for lack of a better term, deadly fuck. And what's even worse, regardless of whether or not you've made any effort to evade said chaotic perils, you'd still end up getting your chopper trashed more times than in Sega's Super Thunderblade. In terms of boss lineups, you've got a massive as fuck super tank, some goddamn T-Rex named Dorf, aka the long-lost metrosexual meth addict bastard child of Sharptooth from the Land Before Time, and Lizzie from Rampage, and Cantor, two-headed wolf behemoth to name a few, amongst those earlier established threats you'll confront. Balto and King Ghidorah, meet your new fucking bestie. Do I even need to remind everyone that those altercations are where the next field of reference comes into play? While the gameplay aspect tends to incorporate new twists and innovations, their setbacks and undoings all but atone for them in just about every way possible. Case in point, speaking of which, those counterintuitive and degraded as fuck controls! In terms of d forces challenge, be prepared to blow a huge goddamn gasket, cause every nerve-wracking element I've addressed thus far pretty much applies to this painstaking department. In addition, you'll be faced with avoiding collisions and even the tendency to sustain every single revolting as fuck life loss, especially when it involves either the endless aircraft squadrons that pack themselves in like fucking sardines, or the trademark altitude shifts, for instance cases when you're knocking into any hazard, projectile, or unsuspecting adversary when you intended otherwise, upon either raising or lowering, in which case it's the player's own goddamn fault. You know the old saying, don't blame the computer, blame the operator. In other cases, even if you rub that one congregation of enemy squadrons, flocks, or packs, more happen to pop up unexpectedly, and it can get extremely, I shit you not, extremely motherfucking tedious. And before I forget, upon losing your last life, you'll notice that your chopper will start spiraling out of control as it dramatically descends way down into the field, so be prepared to envision that a lot as well, as it'll forever be burned into the retina of every curious yet carefree player who dares to survive this cataclysmic clusterfuck of a shmup. Starting out with 1 to 9 lives, don't expect any extras here, and several limited continues. As ever, don't be too goddamn surprised if they run out. As ever, for an early Super NES game hailing from the same year as these titles listed here, the presentation is nothing more than a myriad of horrendous eyesores after another, especially involving the scaling features. Notwithstanding the beneficial slowdown effects and the semi-misleading design of your main chopper, the overall frame rate of the game, in tandem with the top few field designs and drab hues, leave a hell of a lot to be desired. Seriously, they make even E.T. on Atari 2600 look like Secret of Mana and Chrono Trigger combined. Shit, need I go on any further? 
In terms of music and sound, composed by Asmic's own sound team, of whomever they're made up, God only knows. As unique as the soundtrack is, with the title theme turning out to be nothing more than a variant of the French National Anthem, La Marchiez, and the ending theme a variant of the Soviet National Anthem, my salutations to all Russians everywhere, by the way. I, however, have no other alternative but to look the other godforsaken way, seeing how there's barely anything noteworthy at all, except probably the boss theme, thanks to its uninspired-ass melodies and repetitious series of loops. The sound effects could have used more tune-ups in conjunction with the on-screen effects, seeing as they're a match made in hell that flat-out screen blot to the ass end of Orion's belt and back. Replayability-wise, other than every element I've touched upon so far, there's very little to comment on at this juncture. And getting back to the altitude shifting technique, which for the last fucking time only works in the exploration areas and mode, it's a huge necessity when it comes to the boss altercations. Enjoy it while it lasts, because beyond just that one tip alone, I strongly advocate against even wasting your precious time and or dinero on this ignominious disgrace to all fourth generation consoles. Bottom line, stick with those earlier recounting shmup titles. You'll feel a hell of a lot better, trust me. Therefore, what's my final verdict on Asmic's triple threat of oddities? There isn't much more to express about them that hasn't already been God knows how many times. Sure, no one so much as gave 45,783 shits about what Asmic had to offer way back when they were all the rage, or still has, God forbid, but you gotta admit, their track record with each new release they throw out is rather solid, if sometimes half-assed, and consider this my final reiteration. Do yourself a humble and unregrettable favor, and stick with both the former and penultimate titles, namely Crystal Palace and Boomer's Adventure, but whatever you do, steer the hell clear of the latter at any motherfucking cost! And until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off.